Hello everyone, um, welcome to this evening webinar. Um, I'm Ashley McGilloway, I'm the Programme Secretary for Siwam Scottish Branch and I'd like to welcome you all to this talk on urban river restoration, which is part of the Siwam Land and Water Management Series. Our speaker this evening is Sally Monchik. Sally is a hydrologist and geomorphologist with 11 years experience in river and catchment restoration and natural flow management. Over her career so far, she's been involved in leading an EU working group conference on natural flow management contributed to the Beaumont Catchment Restoration Study and has been part of a team that undertook geomorphology field surveys of degraded watercourses. Sally has been with ACOM for seven years and has developed a portfolio of river restoration projects with a company within Scotland. Her knowledge and experience of leading urban river restoration in Scotland continues to develop as she leads a number of projects. Um, personally, I think this topic is very timely. I think 2020 has taught us all just how important our access to nature is and it's encouraging to see more and more media coverage around the subject of people reconnecting with rivers. Um, Sally is going to discuss two projects which aim to improve the physical and geomorphological connection of degraded watercourses, which will help us protect these rivers as assets. Sally is going to speak for about 40 minutes with 15 minutes of questions and answers to follow. If you can direct your questions and answers to the Q&A section on Zoom and we'll cover these at the end. Um, also just to note this presentation will be recorded and will be available on our website at a later date. Um, so without further ado, I'll just hand you over to Sally. Thanks, Ashling. I will bring up my first slide here, which um, to highlight Ashling's point there about um, our, our rivers and our green spaces. This photo was one that we took um, in lockdown when we had incredibly low river levels and beautiful weather and my kids have never spent so much time in rivers and burns and woodland and around we we do that a lot but i have to say we really really valued our local uh, spaces this is allen water close to where we live and um, so we're, we're very fortunate so um yeah i really hope that um you know this time that we've been through and and continue to go through will will you know, uh, bring more momentum to river restoration projects as people value their green spaces more. Right, I'm just going to put my video off so I can concentrate and uh, and crack on here. Okay, so yeah, as Ashling said, I'm Sally Homantic. I've um, uh, I'm a senior consultant with ACOM, specialising in river restoration and natural flood management. Um, I this is the the kind of plan for my, my talk. Just want to give you a little bit of background about myself, although Ashling's done a bit of that already, um, and just talk about yeah, why we restore rivers, what's geomorphology and um, restoring rivers in Scotland. And then I'll take you through uh, three project examples that I have and um, just a few lessons learned at the end. Um, I've put this slide up here kind of talking really to those of you who might be earlier on in your career I've been on a very varied journey as you can kind of see from this and I never expected to get to where I am but I'm very fortunate to be doing a job that I really love and um, I'm very passionate about and but I you know it's taken me time to get there and I've done bits and pieces of work that I didn't enjoy uh, quite so much along the way and so um, yeah this just kind of highlights how um, you know, all these things feed into what I do now, river restoration, you know, you need to consider hydrology and um, uh, flooding and um, looking at the whole catchment and looking at geomorphology and all these, just, you know, different aspects and, and geology and, you know, there's, a, there's so many things to consider when um, restoring rivers and looking at catchment. So um, I take all of these experiences, even though some of them were not so enjoyable at the time, um, as as a bonus really for what I do now. So if you if you're stuck in a job doing something you don't love, then don't don't lose hope. There's um you know th there's opportunities and, and just take every experience that you've got and and use it. So that was just a wee a wee plug for that. Um, so yeah, why do we restore rivers? So um, as far as I can understand, 45% of Water Framework Directive classified watercourses in Scotland in 2018 were less than good um, as an overall status and 13% of all the Water Framework Directive classified watercourses were less than good for morphology. So, you know, there's a, there's a good chunk of rivers in Scotland that do not come out well for morphology, but they obviously have other issues as well, whether it's... Um, uh, you know, issues with flows or water quality or ecology. So degraded rivers, you know, when when you when those are there, the when they're um, uh, in, in a place, you know, you, you've got poor habitat, you've 
you know, lack of fish or um, and and the species that might rely on them and vertebrates as well. And um, you know, where those are are lacking, then you know, you're generally going to lack um, aquatic ecology. Um, yeah, aesthetic. You know, it just so many places you don't want to go by the river because they're not nice and they're full of shopping trolleys. Um, but also increasing flood risk where, where rivers are modified and straightened and, and um, you're going to get issues with flood risk downstream. So in restoring rivers, we're looking to provide a catalyst for wider landscape change, if possible, um, that, you know, we, we, we focus on the river, but, but actually the, the spaces around them are critical as well and can, and can bring about change as well. The same with water quality. We may not be able to address water quality directly through restoration projects, although some perhaps will. Um, they can also be a catalyst for um, wider management of, within a catchment that can lead to water quality improvements. Again, reduce, reduce flooding if we can um, by you know, increasing the length of channels or in reconnecting floodplains, uh, improving habitat within the channel and without. Um, and, and just species diversity in general uh, and encouraging community input, you know, really getting community groups involved and getting kids out. And I think um, as much as outdoor spaces are important for, for each of us, they're also great for kids and outdoor learning is um, more important now than ever, I think. So just a quick <clears throat> look at geomorphology for me, that is the absolute starting point of any res river restoration project. We need to understand our landscape and the processes that are occurring that have occurred in the past, how we've modified them, you know, how sediments are moving through our system and how we've changed that in terms of fluvial geomorphology. Um, and there are just some applications, other applications of fluvial geomorphology, but the focus of this obviously is for river restoration and improvement. So um, these are just some images of some typical pressures that we might find on some of our Scottish rivers. Um, when, we're, when we're thinking about restoring rivers, we're looking at re removing pressures and these come in a variety of forms. So that top picture A there is, you know, concrete banking. The river itself is, is actually not bad, but it can erode its, its banks because it's walled in there, to perhaps to protect utilities or, you know, just protect buildings and things from flooding and erosion. We've got structures such as weirs, like in uh, picture B there, it's built on bedrock. So there was a natural step there, but they've built on top of that and created a higher um, structure. Um, you know, bridges, culverts, embankments, for example, you know, these types of structures really have an impact on our rivers and um, the sediment transport processes and hydrology. Poor water quality, that um, picture C, you can see there is, is um, as a result of um, drainage that that is it falls into the river. D, this is agricultural land, so the river has been dredged and straightened and banked to protect farmland and increase drainage and of the land. E, um, again, another urban setting where it's sheet piled on one side to you know to protect uh, properties from flooding and erosion. Um, and actually on the right bank, you can't really see it, but there's a big earth embankment along there for flood protection as well. So um, the river's hemmed in on both sides. And the last picture there is a water course that's been um, historically diverted. So the route is longer than it naturally would be. So the gradient is very shallow and there's quite a lot of silt input into the system. So it's just clogged up. It's very sluggish um, it's, and it's not happy. So SEPA Water Environment Fund, um, all three projects I'm going to talk about today are funded partly through this uh, source, which is the primary route for river restoration funding in Scotland. So there are drivers for the funding um, and projects that meet these objectives are more likely to be taken forward. So those that are less than good um, for morphology, those that are located in areas of social deprivation, um, so where, you know, communities have lack of access to good quality green space and natural environment, you know, that's of detriment. So wherever we can enhance that and improve um, local areas for communities, then that's where they are, tend to be targeted. Also improving access to the river, you know, many places our rivers are fenced off or embanked and hidden um, or culverted. And, and so actually just encouraging people to re-engage with the rivers again. Um, also projects where wider benefits can be realised, where there's wider landscaping opportunities and community involvements um, and, you know, getting groups together to, to undertake work or um, maintain or just, you know, have friends of groups and things. Those are the types of projects that, um, that are looked at. 
Um, there are a lot of projects that are more primarily fish passage, uh, fish barriers to fish passage and removal projects, but a lot of the projects I'm talking about um, also have an element of that. There are some that are specifically fish barrier removal projects. So just some key themes really um, that I've uh, come across that I've kind of thought of as I've gone through some of these projects, um, really focusing on when we're restoring channels, really thinking about the, the typology of the river, what the river setting, what is the, the landscape that it's sitting in? Is it a steep water course? Has it got lots of floodplains? Should it be meandering? You know, is there lots of gravel input to the system or, you know, what type of river it is? And, and so when we're restoring, we're not trying to restore it to something that it wouldn't naturally want to be. We want it to be as sustainable and natural as possible when we undertake work. Uh, removing pressures, um, some of those pressures that I mentioned, if we can, we're improving the score of the watercourse and, and giving it, you know, space and freedom to move. So enhancing the geomorphological processes and just encouraging it to re-establish that. Um, but we're very aware of working within the constraints, you know, in urban settings, we we recognise that we're not going to get pristine, perfect watercourses, but we do what we can within the constraints we have. Um, so another outcome would be yeah, community involvement and, and creating space for community for outdoor education. Active travel is an important part of, of these projects um, and, and just you know, amenity of the area, enjoying the outdoors, encouraging people to be outside and use their space. And then on the bottom there, access to watercourse. So that might involve vegetation management or removing fences and structures and um, or reprofiling banks, perhaps. Creating access routes, you know, adding footpaths or bridges where that's appropriate. And then ecological enhancement, thinking of, you know, the in-channel work, whether it's the bed or the water quality, um, as well as the banks of the river, tree and woodland management, creating riparian woodland where it's missing or enhancing nearby woodlands. Wetland creation or enhancement as well, that, you know, we've got lots of wee pockets of wetlands around and you know, that we can do work to improve those and make those better. So just a general um, biodiversity enhancement as well as um, re reconnecting fragmented habitats. So these are all kind of aims that um, that are, if we can achieve as part of a river restoration project are, are really great. So some of the challenges though, we don't have a, a whole suite of perfectly pristine rivers in Scotland um, for many reasons. Um, as I said, there's a lot of pressures. We've got lots of weirs and lots of hard banking and flooding issues and all kinds of things. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the pressures are one thing and then the constraints, so we can't increase flood risk. We'll look to improve it if we can, but often we can't remove structures because, you know, they protect properties from flood risk. Land ownership, a lot, the majority of projects tend to be focused on public land, but um, that's not always possible. And so there's, you know, it can take time and a fair bit of effort to engage with landowners and get agreements and compensation or whatever is required. Utilities can provide, can be a constraint as well. Um, some places can divert utilities and other places it just makes it, you know, not viable. We can make a project not viable. The extent of historic modification can be such that it's just, yeah, not possible to, to get a very natural river and it just might not be worth doing doing if we just can't get enough benefit from it. Contaminated land, a lot of these sites are former industrial sites, you know, with mills along the river and, and um, factories and things associated with that. So we quite often come across contaminated land. Community buy-in, you would think, you know, somebody's coming along to spend lots of money in your local area and create a nice river and green space for you, but um, you think you would be really happy about that, but that's not always the case, as you'll see um, from one of my projects. Um, so, you know, that's, that's an important, the more buy-in we can have on these projects, the more successful they can be in the long run. You have, you know, communities, people out picking up litter and, you know, just kind of policing areas and looking after them and, and that's, you know, can really help a project in the long term. And then also funding, looking to leverage other funding, SEPA will Water Environment Fund, you know, funds the river aspects of the work, but we need, you know, additional funding to bring in to, to um, complement that and do some of the wider work. Uh, I've got a comment there, the projects tend to be local and reach scale. I know there are some bigger projects going on and looking at whole catchments and different reaches of rivers, but in general, you know, they, they can quite often be fairly localised, which is absolutely fine, um, but it just, you know, over time you can hopefully do more on a river. Um, but it's time consuming, even these individual projects are really, really take time to get there and they're expensive, it's a lot of money 
to develop these projects. So these are definitely some of the challenges, but it doesn't make it impossible. And um, as I hope you see. So I'll just run you through um, these three examples that I have. Um, the, I'm a project manager. And so I'm fortunate that I have a background in hydrology and geomorphology, geology as well, um, and work closely with landscape, civil engineers, e ecologists, um, as well as active travel people. And a whole range um, is really important on my projects and um, you know these a good collaborative team is the best approach I think if you can achieve that. So these are the three project locations. To the west there is the Levern Water in Barhead in East Renfrewshire Council. The middle one is the Tollcross Burn in Sandy Hills Park in the east end of Glasgow and finally the Bathgate Water over in West Lothian in the centre of Bathgate. Going to start with the toll cross burn this is our project that is the furthest developed in fact it's close to completion of construction in the next few weeks or so so the toll cross burn is a very urbanized it has a very urbanized catchment even the small area of agricultural land at the top end is is uh, is very uh, unpleasant up there too it's very um modified the red parts of the line are culverted sections of the burn. So you can see there's there's extensive culverting and not you know only you know separate length of, of natural channel. Um, the area we're looking at is where the Black Star is there, Sandy Hills Park. And so it's a culverted section and the the project is a deculverting project. So we're creating a new channel through the park um, and disconnecting the pipe. So just um, looking at the through the catchment of the toe cross burn, it's a heavily modified water body, <clears throat> which is a classif classification given for those water courses that have just such extensive pressures that can't be removed. So whether you know because of flooding or or erosion or whatever other reasons, um, th these pressures can't be taken away. So you can see, for example, the the second picture there. Um, you know, there's houses right there. If you take away walls and, and protection if you allowed the river to move around you know you're going to have issues of flooding and damage to property so um that's just one example it's under the water framework directive it has bad ecological potential and morphology is bad so it's a one not it's as bad as you can get pretty much as the toll cross burn so um yeah the left picture is up in the agricultural area you can see even there it's it's not nice it's very sluggish and um straight and deep uh, so yeah, because of the culverting, there's not access to water course, the water course in many and much of the catchment. Um, it's hidden behind gardens or fences or walls and in culverts. High impact realignment, that's HIRs, where it's been realigned and it's having a, a, a very damaging effect on the water course and the functioning of it. So siltation is also an issue, partly from the farmland, also from urban drainage. There are quite a number of CSOs, so lots of nasties that can get into the river in high flows. And the habitat is generally not great for the majority of the length. So this is Sandy Hills Park. This is where our project is focused. Um, so the, the project was um, brought about by Glasgow City Council and um, consultation was done. Basically the, the park is a, an, has an issue with antisocial behaviour. The habitat isn't great and the, you know the park doesn't have an awful lot of interest. The burn was is culverted beneath the park um, but historically was an open channel um, and in the war there was housing built on top of the park um, and the, the burn was and the, when the housing was taken away the burn was never released from its culvert. So um, this bottom picture there is a multi-use games area, which is set in a kind of depression. It's got trees around it. It's quite hidden. And so it's a real focus for antisocial behavior. Um, and there, you can see just in the background, there's high rise flats behind. So there's housing all around, you know, it's right in the middle of the city. So our commission was to take um, a high level design that was had been put together and take that to outline detailed design and um, through planning, car application, and the construction is now on site, as I mentioned, due to be com largely complete, complete by the end of the year. So we had some challenges um, on this project as we do for everyone, but um, this one in particular was community opposition. So I mentioned that earlier, the 
engagement was done at the earlier stage of the project and really didn't pick up on any particular issues with the project but I think um, as people got a hold of it they found lots of reasons why it shouldn't be done they were concerned about flood risk they were concerned about child safety with open water um, they were concerned about the number of trees being taken out they were concerned about not enough trees being taken out um, so all yeah all sorts of reasons why the scheme shouldn't go ahead but Anyway, it came through planning and um, they were satisfied that it was nothing material and we could carry on. So we had a big pro program de delay as part of that, which is an issue. And just issues with getting surveys done in the park and things, you know, people were um, yeah, concerned about people being in the park doing surveys. And, and so that just meant we had a little bit less information than we would have liked to have um, for the contractor. And uh, we, um, but anyway, we worked through that and, we, and we, we got there. So it'll be very interesting to see how the community respond to the project going forward. Um, uh, I really hope that it will be positive, um, even though there's been some strong voices against the scheme. I think the community in general will be supportive when they see what's been done. So we diverted the Scottish water sewer as a combined, combined sewer as part of the project as well. But the benefits of the scheme, so 400 metres of deculverted uh, river, so a pressure removed, uh, improved geomorphology where there was no natural bed at all. We now have a nice gravel bed with some riffles and pools and things um, in it, created habitat within the channel and, and beside it, and obviously community access to the river, it just wasn't there. This is our design. Um, you, um, you can see um, the, the, the culvert just went straight across the park, but the, the burn now comes out of a culvert at the, at the top end. The bottom right corner is the upstream end and follows this gently sinuous route down. Um, we've got sort of floodplain wetland. We've given the river some space so that it can, you know, it can flood and have some wetter areas of, for planting. Footpath follows the burn all the way down. And we've got a new footbridge. Obviously, we, there was no burn there before. So a nice footbridge across just give a good view as well and access through the park. The Balbegi Street um, is a necessary road but it's an important bus route and things so we had to retain that um, and couldn't keep an open channel all the way down so we decided to put a culvert through the middle so it's culverted in the middle and again at the very downstream end um, so a small culvert before it goes into open channel just downstream. Uh, we've got stepping stones in the river and as I said riffles and pools um, and features in the channel. So this middle area, the funny shape um, in the middle there is the multi-use games area. Um, and what we decided to do, because it was such a problem, and we also were obviously ex excavating a lot of material, we decided to fill that in and, and make a kind of mound. There was an aspiration for bike tracks in the park. So we've kind of created a platform for that in the future and reduced the amount of excavated material um, being disposed off-site. Um, and uh, and also taking away this this hollow, you know, that was uh, a wee hub of antisocial behaviour. So hopefully we see improvement um, from that as well. These are just some quick sketches that were done just to support the consultation process, but just to give people a feel of of the park and how you know how it will be um, when it's done. So construction phase. This is the only one I have construction photos of, but it's great to see it in in action. So. Um, this was just a, a week or two ago. So we've got the channel largely constructed apart from the very top end, I think, as I last heard. Um, the bridge is in place. Footpaths are beginning to be formed now. Um, you can see on the right hand side, the material in the channel. So we've got a, a, a more natural bed. The first two pictures here left in the middle are the Balbegi Street culvert. So that view upstream of the culvert towards the footbridge and then downstream towards the bottom culvert as well. So we've tried to create, you know, the, the, we've not got loads of gradient here. So we've not got a very sinuous route. It's just, you know, gently um, curving and with features in the channel that on the right side there, you can see a riffle exposed. Um, the, the, you know, the flows are not great. It's, it's a small water course and it's fairly shallow. So, you know, you can just imagine kids pottering about in there and wellies and having fun. Just a few more images, got stepping stones, that middle picture there is the stepping stones. Um, and then the right picture is down to the downstream end. 
in the bottom culvert. I recommend that you visit SEPA's Facebook page and I think possibly LinkedIn as well. SEPA have got videos um, talking about the project as it's been progressing, I think. So yeah, keep up, up to date with the progress if you want to see more and how it looks as time goes on. Hopefully it will establish and, and be a really nice area. And I, yeah, we're really hoping for positive outcome for the community. So I'll move on to the Lever Water in Barhead. This is a bigger, much bigger river. Um, the catchment is um, upstream of Barhead. We've got some small reservoirs um, and kind of agricultural land. Then, the, then it makes its way down and, and all the way through Barhead and then eventually at the bottom end uh, into the White Cart water. Our project site is the the, in the middle there with the black star in the centre of Barhead. So this is our study reach um, that we're looking at. We are doing works um, in places all the way along this reach, but our particular focus is where the star is there. This is the, what we call Walton Street um, site. It's a brownfield site, um, a historic um, a depot um, that's that's been left as a rather unpleasant eyesore in the middle of Barhead. Um, very close to the town centre, just to the south of that is council offices and the high street supermarket and all of that. It's, it's a, an important through route for people, you know, moving between housing site and the, the main street. So it's, um, it's very visible. So I'll just show you some pictures of other parts of the river. Again, this is a heavily modified water body, as was the Toe Cross Burn. It has poor status under, sorry, poor ecological potential, potential under the Water Framework Directive and has moderate status for morphology. So it's slightly less bad than the Toe Cross Burn, um, but there's definitely still some issues. The left picture there is a, a wee flood storage area with a, um, a, a culvert throttling the flow. And then this massive weir upstream of railway crossing. The third picture there is um, just immediately upstream of our study site, some protection work that was recently done um, protecting utilities. And then downstream of our site, there's um, flood embankment. So yeah, we've got redundant structures, redundant weirs in particular, quite a number of them, high impact realignment, engineered banks, lack of access to the river again, a uh, lack of amenity. amenity. So this is um, some pictures from our study area. The picture on the left there is our Walton Street site. So it gives you a feel for how unpleasant it's looking. It's a, you know, it's a important linkage for people walking, but it doesn't feel safe, particularly at night. Um, it's this horrible fence and piles of rubbish and fires and needles and all that kind of stuff in here. Um, so not a nice area and on the vacant and derelict land register. So something for the council to, that we're, you know, we're keen to deal with this site. Uh, the second picture there is, is a redundant weir. Um, it's quite a, got quite a deep scar pool and um, the left bank is eroded. There was a Scot there's a Scottish water pipe there that failed historically. So there's quite beefy bank protection there just to maintain that. Um, we've got a real issue of invasive species, lots of knotweed and things. It's been quite well treated along this reach, but it's, but it's been there and there are a variety of other species as well. Um, but in some areas, it's just too, too much to tackle. Engineered banks, again, this third picture are these lovely gabions um, exposed now. There was trees, you can see they've been chopped down um, for just a sense of public safety. I think people felt unsafe walking across the bridge and to the town. Um, so the trees were cut, but it does then expose these not nice looking banks. And finally there, the, the Kirkton Burn is a tributary that um, discharges into the Leverham water within our study area. And most people won't even know that it exists because it's culverted from right at the top end of the town down to here. So, um, and, and, and where it discharges, you, you don't even see it. So that was something to consider in our design. So this, this project started, came about as a catchment study of tributaries of the white cart water and we undertook extensive disk study and some field walkovers to look for potential river restoration and natural flood management opportunities so we covered 28 miles of water courses we um, undertook a multi-criteria analysis and and came out with a number of reaches that were had you know good opportunities 
So East Renfrewshire Council and the SEPA selected, and SEPA selected this reach of the Lever Water in Barhead, and we have subsequently undertaken outline detailed design, and currently preparing the tender package at the moment for the works. So this is our design proposal for the Walton Street site. Um, basically, the river was in had this 90 degree bend around the edge of the site, so kind of where the line of trees are on the south side, along the footpath um, is where the river is now, it's fenced off and not very natural looking. So the plan is to bring it out from there and excavate a new channel through the site. So, um, you know, fairly major earthworks to, to deal with the concrete there and and um, lots of made ground, but, but basically forming a, a nice channel that contains the flood water as well, um, but that has, you know, channel features within it. You can see point bars there and riffles and pools. Um, footpaths around and access, places to stop, benches and, you know, a space that is just not there. People would only hurry through this area, whereas we're creating somewhere that people can spend time. The other thing you'll notice is the Kirkton burn. So the culvert, um, coming out of the culvert on the south there, and we've, um, the challenge was to decide what to do with the Kirkton burn so that it would still flow into the main river. So we decided to create a new channel and carry it down, convey it down at the downstream end of this part. So it's got some features on it too, and stepping stones. Um, and we're excited about the fact that people will get to know about this water course that's just been hidden for a long time. Uh, yeah, so that's the the main the main kind of focus area for the design. But we also have upstream some some creation of some bed features in the channel downstream. We're planning to remove the weir that was in the picture there, um, and then further downstream some inset floodplain. Also, just um, downstream of this part is um, looking to do something with these gabions and try and remove at least in part the gabions along that reach. So we've had again some some fairly major challenges. Um, one of the things was the there was planned social housing on the Walton Street site. So we had originally hoped to tie in with the housing and link the two together, but the site is at flood risk and it just was not possible for housing. So it's given us more space for restoration, which is brilliant, but um, it just led to major program delay, and that project is now on hold. Um, so we we hope to you know give some planning guidance so that the two whenever the housing is built, that they make full use of the riverside environment, you know, to look onto. But at the moment, there's not, nothing happening with that. And um, we have to divert our combined sewer as well as part of the project. And, see, and Scottish Water have also been doing some work um, in the area. So just trying to link in with them if we can, um, you know, to reduce the amount of work that they would have to do and so that the two projects link up um, and we don't end up redoing things. Also flooding, we were very aware of flood mechanisms and not wanting to change that and, and you know, increase flooding somewhere um, just the way that, because this is all um, part of the floodplain. So we've, we've considered that carefully. Also had to redesign, come up with a design for the, the Kirkton burn uh, for where it comes out, the culvert. One of the other major issues we've had is just trying to re retain mature trees. So really in our design and thinking about our earthworks um, and, you know, the construction site, how we can retain mature trees. So there's ongoing work around that um, because some of the trees are nice and, and the more that we can retain in the long term, the better. And we've had many, many discussions around erosion protection. And this, you know, this is something that comes up in, in some projects. This one is unique out of my projects because other ones are not so energetic but this system is energetic and you know as much as we want rivers to be natural and able to move around and give space to them it's we are constrained within the urban area so we've had real debate um, between SEPA and the council and ourselves as to what is an appropriate level of risk to accept for the river to shift itself and change over time so I think we've come up with a uh, in between um, solution that allows the river to have some movement and adjustment to settle itself, but without hopefully massive change to the design in the long term. But the benefits that we hope to see are improved fish passage by removing the weir and SEPA are also looking at other structures on the river as well um, to improve the overall um, fish passage. 
improving geomorphology, kickstarting the process, you know, encouraging some erosion here and there and allowing the river just to function more naturally, creating habitat um, and, and looking at the wider landscape as well, community access, as I've talked about, and amenity improvement. So yeah, the real hope is that this project will, will bring you know, a bit of vitality to the centre of Barhead and regenerate that whole area. Um, so we're, we're enthusiastic about it and hoping it's going to all go to plan. We are just, as I said, finalising the design, going through planning and car, preparing the tender package and due for construction to start early in 2020. So fingers crossed. And my last project to talk about is the Bathgate Water in the centre of Barhead. So this is the catchment area. Our study centre of our study site is at the Black Star there. So there's two burns that converge within the study area, the bog burn to the east and the bog head burn to the west. And I think the names give a bit of an indication about our landscape setting here. This is, it just feels like kind of a bowl and it would just wanted to be a bog. It just wants to be wet. I think historically, you know, chances are there, there may have been small discrete channels, but it was probably just wet um, and and the, over time the the water courses have been dug out and straightened and you know trying to improve drainage of this area um, but really naturally it should it should just be low gradient and wet and boggy this is our, our the actual study area so you can see the two burns coming in there with the blue arrows from the east and the west there's uh, quite a series of ponds here on the south the three ponds on the south are suds ponds related to housing development and on the north these are for flood management so the bog burn is throttled um, by culvert and encouraged as it gets to a certain level to spill over into these ponds to provide flood storage um, but the, the habitat in the ponds is not particularly great and um, the, the river is certainly very impacted by all the structures. The, so when the two burns converge, they become the Bathgate water. And as you can see, that is just dead straight uh, through, through this area, um, crosses the railway line and um, down through the bottom part of the site. So um, I'll show you this next picture to highlight my points on, on that slide. This, this area would have been on the outskirts of Bathgate. Um, we've got the golf course to the sort of northeast there, um, and then the town centre further to the north, and train station and, and shops and all of that. So it would have you know originally been on the edge of the settlement, but over time Bathgate's expanded so much that it has now been completely encircled by housing and, and other development. And so there's this massive green area in the middle of all of this development that's just never really been designed or or thought about or really um, managed. And so there's a great opportunity here. We've just got this, this huge space to work with um, beside the water courses. So um, that's, that's been an important part of this project, thinking about the wider green space and how people travel through the active travel element of it. There's a national cycle network that comes through the middle of the site, um, as well as footpaths, informal footpaths that people use. And people really use this area a lot, but um, I think there is an aspiration to see it improved. So some of the issues we've got, I get all the really lovely watercourses to deal with. This is another um, heavily modified water body um, with bad ecological potential and is bad for morphology. So um, all the good stuff. Uh, this left picture is the bog burn showing it's, you know, it's quite in size. It's got steep banks, banks. it's disconnected from floodplain. The, you know, the grass is cut and there's not many trees and um, yeah, right on the edge of housing. Um, so it's, you know, close to where people are. The second picture there is the water quality issue um, that I had mentioned before. This There's a couple of major outfalls um, that come from an industrial state and there's an ongoing project to look at the management of, of the drainage network there and try and improve the water quality in the river because that's, that's really of concern. Um, it's very visible. So the, the, burn, the burns have been affected by the changes to hydrology with the flood storage areas. That third picture there is also flood storage area, a smaller one on the bog head burn, um, but it's throttled and, and, and spills into these sort of storage ponds. We've got contaminated land here. This was historically a mining area and there were industrial sites as well. So there's a definite issue that's been identified 
um, with contamination, although we do think that um, groundwater is in connection with the river and so you know we're thinking about pathways not creating new pathways for contamination so um, high, high impact realignment again engineered banks you know lots of places where you just don't see the water courses at all there's embankments and and lots of vegetation and, and things just make it difficult to get into and it certainly doesn't look very pretty that's for sure um, invasive species and um, silt deposition and channel vegetation it's sluggish um, and and yeah it doesn't look very nice lots of complaints from local people about how the river looks so this is um, the top picture there is uh, one of the culverts at one of the flood storage areas so very unnatural channel and uh, I realize this is my first trolley fo trolley photograph um, but I'm sure every each one of my rivers have had many trolley photographs but um, yeah not not nice looking watercourse at all so the project has come through has had quite a long history and um, there was a previous planning application that was submitted and withdrawn but there was just some issues over flood risk um, and uncertainty over contaminated land. And so we were tasked with optioneering and coming up with um, proposals for river restoration in a, in a slightly wider area than was originally considered. And we submitted our report to, to the council and SEPA at the end of last year um, for approval for funding. So we have the go ahead, um, I think just about to move on to the next stages um, of design. So I'll not go through this in detail, but basically we have six reaches um, incorporating the bog burn, bog head burn and the bathgate water, and they all have slightly different character. And so really, you know, we've we've focused our design on the setting and and the typology and as very much as well what what people want from from their area too. So we've looked at the footpath network and how that connects and how people can get in and see the, the river in different places and things. So um, yeah, reach one is very open it was that area next to the housing um so yeah just looking to to get it more natural we've decided not to take the channel out from where it is in any of these places we don't want to increase the channel length and um, we also don't want to increase flooding we, we've got this issue of contaminated land so if you start digging out lots of earth you know what do we do with it and there's expensive disposal costs and things so we've decided to largely retain the channels where they are but just create some more diversity narrow them and give them some sinuosity um, reduce maintenance is have a you know more wild riparian zones if we can more trees and things as I mentioned there's lots of boggy bits and wetland areas so and looking to enhance those where we can removing any structures that we can do safely without increasing flood risk or um, or causing any other problems so um, at reach four is a is a kind of hint um, keystone of the whole thing it's, a, it's an important reach it's where it becomes the bathgate water it's much bigger and it's very straight and very deep and uh, just silted and sluggish and very unpleasant so we're, we're hoping to be able to take away an embankment which allows us to open up the river and then yeah just using a variety of measures to to narrow and um, give some diversity to that channel without taking it out from where it is or in, you know increasing the channel length particularly just um, using what we can in that area. Reach five is downstream of the railway line. So that reach five and six are much more uh, managed public park areas. So, um, and one of the key things about reach five is that we have a big area of wetland that's sitting there now and um, it's kind of monoculture. It's not, you know, it's not great. Um, and I think our, the aspiration is really for a community project to take that on. Um, we would like to increase some access to it, create some outdoor learning space beside it um, and maybe, you know, do some scrapes and some planting and whatever we can do to enhance that wetland area, blocking ditches and things, um, but really looking for the community to take that on as a, a wee project in and of themselves. So hopefully that that is able to progress. Reach six then is the most kind of public part. Um, it's, um, I'll show you in the, the images. Um, but it's, it's an area that's used quite, for quite a lot of public events and so yeah we're looking to improve the amenity of the river there and also create some community space. These are just some quick map images I'll not go through these in detail but just showing different measures in, in each of the reaches really um, and we've, yeah just map these at a high level just as a kind of concept at this stage. 
So one thing we found really useful in this project was the landscape team have produced visuals of just the the concept, just the high level feeling of the experience that we want to create in each of our six reaches. So this is the, the bog burn here, the picture on the right there is how it looks now, but the picture on the left, just to give a sense of, you know, making the river more accessible um, for kids to come in and play and just so that you can see it, you know, more varied planting um, and just more natural looking, perhaps without the big giant boulders, I think. but. These pictures here are from uh, the left picture is the woodland, which is where the close to where the two burns uh, converge. So there's lots of informal paths, and we've been told that people really like the feeling of being out from the town and being in the wilderness. They don't want to lose that. We don't want big formal paths put through these areas, but they do want to be able to access a bit more easily and be a bit, bit less muddy. So yeah, just looking to manage the woodland a bit better and have some of these informal paths. And then the picture on the right, maybe you know some some bigger footpaths in some areas. This is the flood storage ponds. So just you know formalizing the footpaths and enhancing these areas. Um, as I said, the ponds are drying out a bit. They're not the best for ecology, and that we're hoping we can do something to enhance them you know as environment and, and looking at the burn coming through here seeing what we can do the image on the top on this slide is reach four as i mentioned you know a really key central part of the the study area and yeah we're looking here to particularly the active travel element and the engagement with the river um we will obviously be doing work in the channel to make that as good as we can although it, we are going to struggle because of the low gradient and just the the modification that's happened here is it's going to be difficult but we'll do our best um but really yeah getting people in and around creating a new access route um there's a path part of the way along the bank on the other side and a big platform for housing so the hope is that we can create a new route and if there, if there comes to be new housing in the future that that can link well with that linking in with the national cycle, cycle network route and creating some new footpaths and hopefully some wetland over on the left of the picture the bottom image there is this wetland that I mentioned um, in the area downstream of the railway, so one that we hope that community could really take on. So yeah, creating the idea is just to, you know, that we're creating some space um, that people can, you know, have some interpretation boards and, and classes can come from the school or whatever, people can spend time here, um, but really hoping for the community to take it on to manage. And this is the bottom end, so the on the right hand side of the picture is what is the, the showground, which really actually at the moment is a not very nice looking car park. Um, so we've shown it with grass as we would like it to look a bit nicer. Um, and on the left of the picture is the public park. So the football pitches, play area and things. So this is a really well traveled, well visited area, but the river doesn't look great. Um, and you don't have access to the right hand side. You know, there's no crossing on the river. So the plan here is to create access so when there are events on in the showground that people can tra travel between the two sides much more easily um, and but also to create this create this seating area I th we just really felt that we could reprofile the banks as they're quite steep there at the moment but reprofile and create this yeah just a sort of natural seating area to encourage people to come and spend time down by the river um, so I hope that gives a sense of you know what kind of feel we're, we want to create here so we've had some challenges, you know, the project's had a long history, as I mentioned, um, and just yet yeah, we are constrained here. There's lots, there are a lot of issues and we want to achieve the best that we can for the river, but within these constraints. So, so that's taken some working through and we've got more to do on that. Um, flooding and contamination are, you know, are very much part of that as well. But the benefits, looking to improve the geomorphology now, we're not going to have a lovely meandering gravel bed river through here because that's not what we would expect to see we don't have a supply of gravel here um, but we're hoping to make the, the channels function more as they would naturally want to be creating habitat within the channel and the banks the wetland areas and improving the woodland areas as well and uh, and again just community access to the river and making space for people to spend time by the river and improving the immunity so I'll just run quickly through some overall lessons learned from um, my projects to date. <clears throat> so as I've talked a few times already, the designing the, the project based on the river typology and the landscape setting, that is just so key. You know, we, we can't make rivers 
do what they don't naturally want to do. So um, working as, as much with the natural processes as we can um, is going to be the most sustainable way forward. Community engagement early and as comprehensive as possible. Now, we're not always going to get it right. We're not going to talk to everyone, but the more that we can do, the better. And the more buy-in and ownership from the community that we can gain um, will really help in the long term with maintenance um, and, and, yeah, just people's enjoyment of it too, I hope. Uh, I've, as I mentioned for the Bathgate project, the input from landscape team was incredibly useful for me and for the stakeholders, I think, I think the visuals were really useful and I'm not great at, you know, producing, I could make maps, but I can't make them look nice. So I, I do just find that close collaboration with landscape team in particular, really helpful, maybe especially in the early stages, but obviously going forward, we need to consider a variety of, of things in our design. So I think that if we can have a strong relationship with, with the landscape team, that's great. Um, and then that, that one, there'd be a re realistic, you know, we are constrained and we're not going to get fully pristine, perfectly natural rivers, but we're looking to do the best that we can within the constraints and overcome those as, as much as possible. So yeah, being creative and and doing what we can. And then also leveraging other funding. So as I mentioned, SEPA fund the river work, but we've um, linked in with Green Action Trust um, and SUSTRANS, for example, they um, have provided support and funding for projects. Um, uh, the Bathgate project has a wider SUSTRANS um, work going on, looking at active travel through Bathgate and, and including our study area. So that's um, been taken forward kind of separately, um, but we'll be linking into our study area as well. So um, yeah, just being creative about that, about other funding sources and getting as others involved for these, you know, get as much benefit out of a project as we can. So I hope that's been interesting. Thank you for listening. I hope I haven't bored you to death. Thank you for sitting down after your work day uh, to listen. My email's there if you've got any questions or you want to get in contact, um, give me a shout and uh, yeah, I'll take questions. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Sally. We have had a number of questions come through, uh, so we'll try and answer as many as we can um, in the next 15 minutes. Um, the first question that's coming is, given the WFD is an EU initiative, how do you envisage the future of river restoration in Scotland changing post-Brexit in terms of the WFD acting as a driver and in terms of funding for projects? Um, as I'm probably not the best authority to speak on that, but as far as I understand, there's not any change. Um, I, I don't know that for sure, but I, I believe that the WEF projects are carrying on as they are. You know, we have we have targets for our rivers. We know how bad they are. And so, um, you know, the, the driver is still there to improve the, the water environment. So, yeah. Thank you. There's a comment just coming underneath that saying that the Scottish Government have indicated they'll stick to the same standards um, with funding from the Water Environment Funds. So hopefully this will continue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the second one, uh, what level of maintenance is generally required after finishing the construction and sign-up of these schemes? Yeah, so it varies. Um, I think, you know, we've talked about different maintenance periods for the contractor. Um, that could vary from two years up to five years, perhaps. And it depends on your client as to whether they, um, yeah, whether they would rather take that on. So for the Leave and Water project, for example, our maintenance period for the contractor is gonna be quite short because the council have already agreed to take over the maintenance of the site and carry that forward. That could include, you know, tree loss within a couple of years or, you know, the main, we may not see um, tree loss immediately. It might come later. So. Yeah, it, it does vary, um, but you're definitely looking at a good few years. You know, you've got um, cutting that needs to be done, any um, taking away of any, you know, dead trees or, or anything that's not survived. Um, you know, and, and it could be that, you know, your river's got some adjustment to do, and, and I think you need to be prepared for that. Whether there's any maintenance that would need to be done on that, possibly not, you know, if you can leave it to establish itself, then that's good. But um, so yeah, it, it's certainly a good few years and, and you just need to work that out um, as a team, you know, what's, what the, if it's the council who's, you know, how long they want that to sit with the contractor and that then obviously adds to the cost on the contractor. So um, yeah, you just need to work that out on a project by project basis. Thank you. Uh, the next one is, how do you decide at what point in time you aim to restore rivers to, for example, how it looked in the 1960s or mm. further back? 
<laughs> um, I, I have to say I don't tend to think about it that way. No, we no. obviously look at the historic maps and, and see what's happened to them over time. But I just, my way of thinking about it is, you know, you, you have what you have now. And so unless anything substantial is going to change around about your river, you're working within you know, the area that you have, um, you know, the gradient of the river is definitely a, an important factor. So um, if it's been realigned massively, then you, you've got to work with that and that might limit what you can do because um, because it's been changed too much. So, yeah, I, I think just I think you're just really looking at your setting rather than a specific point in time. Um, and, you know, the, the as because even if you go back to a specific point in time, the catchment could be could be different. That you know your location might be, um, you might be able to restore it more back to what it had been. But the mm -hmm. catchment changes are such that you know the 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 sediment input has changed, or you know the hydrology has changed because you've got more development, or you know. So I think that you just can't possibly capture all those changes very easily. I think you just got to yeah do the best that you can with how the river is now, get it as natural as you can make it. Yes, of course. So I know there's a lot of move now towards sort of this idea of uh, stage zero restoration, but as you yeah, say, the challenges yeah. uh, now that you have obviously got to work within those constraints. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's a nice idea, but yeah. I think especially <laughs> these urban rivers, we just yes. can't we just can't expect to, <laughs> to achieve that at all. It's not possible. No. Uh, next question um, is, would you know very approximately the financial spend on one of these urban projects, for example, percentage breakdown on consultation, feasibility, design, delivery, monitoring? Mm. To put um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, construction costs, uh, yeah, they will vary. Um, the projects that we've been doing um, are in the region of two or three million construction costs. Um, in advance of that, oh, I don't know, maybe up to £500,000, something like that. Because you, depending on how much GI you have to do, and you've really got to balance, you know, how much you do at each stage of the project. Mm -hmm. um, consultation that, if you can, if the local authority or other organisations can take that on. I know for Bathgate, we've got, um, I think, hoping for funding, external funding for that element of it. Um, Fourth Rivers Trust have been really instrumental in that project. Um, it's been it's part of a wider project that they've been doing with barriers on the. Hammond and Avon and so they undertook consultation as part of that so um but yeah the design stages uh, yeah obviously it depends on how much you're looking at but yeah maybe maybe in the region of half a million some something along those kind of lines and then yeah these the projects I'm talking about are being sort of two to three million ish construction stage thank you a uh, question now on the um, community side of things. So given the initial community resilience to Tall Cross Burn, are there any plans to monitor success of the scheme in terms of community acceptance and social benefits? Yeah, I don't know, actually. I think that would sit with the council and SEPA. Um, my involvement in the project has, has come to an end and we've, we're managing the construction phase. But um, so I, th I think that would be a question for SEPA. Um, and, but I, I, you know, going by the videos and things they've been putting up there, I think they will be keeping a close eye on that and it'll be interesting to see what comes out of it. So, yeah, I'm hoping that they're going to be doing that. That, that doesn't sit with me, though. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next one is for Tall Cross Burn. Where did you get the gravels for the substrate from and how have you ensured that these don't get washed downstream? Yeah, so I think the gravels were sourced from a quarry. Um, we were really, you know, determined to not have something very unnatural looking it's not perfect but um it's it's I have I think I was reasonably happy with what I saw that they put in the channel so so yeah I think it was just a quarry um in somewhere local um and yeah we we undertook modeling uh, modeling of the the channel um 2d modeling to to confirm the velocities and shear stresses so we've sized the material um, according to that, we're not dealing with with huge flows in the toe cross burn. I mean, th there will be some change, and, and I think we would hope for some, you know, some natural shifting around over time. But um, yeah, certainly not hoping for a major washout and not expecting that because the flows are are really quite small. Um, but yeah, that's definitely an important consideration if you're putting in features. You know, uh, modelling is is definitely helpful. Uh, one of the things we've come up with, um, and I've had confirmed by SEPA, is that we they would want to see both 2D and 1D 2D modeling. So for all these projects, I have we have two models, 2D for the restoration, 
design and 1D2D as a flood risk check, um, just because for the flood risk element, you know, they really prefer to see structures modeled in 1D and things, you know, it's more standard way of, of looking at flood risk, but for the design, you're far better in 2D and you just capture that detail for the channel. So we've done that for all our projects. Thank you. And just moving on now to talk a bit more about the, the methods and calculations and modelling. Um, firstly, just in terms of the modelling about the 2D element, um, is that to um, look at how the water interacts on the floodplain um, or is that going down to more sort of the details sort of sediment modelling? We haven't done um, sediment modelling. No, we haven't. We, we've really looked at um, 2D for the channel and the floodplain. So it's it's not a linked 1D 2D. It's a fully 2D model, um, but which allows you then to just capture um, the detail of any features that you put in and look at the the shear stresses and velocities and and making calculations on on the basis of that. So yeah, we haven't done specific sediment modelling, and I don't know that we would really recommend that. Maybe in some situations that would be the right thing to do, but it's a lot of effort and you need a lot of data. So um, yeah, fully 2D modelling of the channel is a, is a really good way of, of getting enough information out um, across the channel and, you know, and all the way downstream capturing that fully to be able to understand the changes that you're making and the sediment sizing and things. So. Thank you. Uh, and is there a particular software that, you, that you'd recommend for that 2D modelling? And also, are there any additional um, calculations that are undertaken to sort of um, supplement that modelling um, to sort of work out the dimensions of the restored channels? Um, we tend to use uh, Tuflo. That, I think that's the software. I'm not a modeller myself, although I've done modelling in the past. It's definitely not my strong point. Hecras, even 2D, is quite good too I think we do tend to use two flow but but Hecras is is freely available um and and actually works fairly well um apart from that really you're just interpreting yeah your velocities and shear stresses um and you know just working out your sediment sizing on the basis of that so that would just be from published papers or whatever Sure. And did you need to make any compromises, for example, um, this is a question asking about provision for erosion protection in areas that required defence? Yeah, so the lever water in particular is one where we had that challenge. It's, it's really not been easy um, to decide on what to do. So I think we, we've gone with sort of clay in the bank and maybe some erosion matting in some places, but um, and where we've got the gabions, you know, the photographs I showed of the gabions, we're retaining some of that. Um, I, we will want to remove as much as we can, but we're, we are aware of erosion along that. It's on the outside of the bend. There's a Scottish water pipe behind it and a footpath, you know, it's an important route. So um, yeah, making some change, creating a little bit of floodplain, but um, still maintaining that that line of defense. So yeah, we, you, you do, it's definitely a compromise. You know, you want the, the river to, to move about but it's got to be kind of within limits so so yeah we had lots of discussions around that um and was there sort of a particular point um for example for sort of very high energy reaches did that vary in terms of sort of how rigidly the water course should be fixed in place um as in was that sort of easier to uh, was that more difficult to negotiate as opposed to sort of lower energy reaches yeah absolutely yeah the um yeah and and places even where there's less infrastructure around or where there's already bank protection in place, you know, make a decision as to whether we we're going to take that away or not, or just keep a line of defence. But yeah, certainly our new reach through the Walton Street site, you know, we had to decide. And actually, it varied, you know, it varies even along that reach on the outer bends or where we've got point bars, you know, we're varying. We're not having the same protection all the way along so that it can can still move about, but in key places trying to keep it pinned. So yeah, it, it's just a, an adaptive approach um, based on your modeling results, very much looking at the modeling results to determine what your areas of greatest stress are gonna be, you know, and, and what you need to protect. Sure. And was, in terms of the type of protection used, was that um, more, for example, using like willow spiling and things? Um, and how does that relate to um, restoring a habitat on the riverbanks? Did those sort of, was there sort of middle ground yeah. to be made for those? Yeah. So uh, we do have a little bit of willow, willow um, downstream of the weir where there's very steep slope and the Scottish water pipe, but we're aware that it grows ferociously. And so we didn't want that elsewhere. So that's, we've, we've not used that upstream because we want the river to be accessible. So we've, we've kept away from that. So we've gone with toe protection. I think some, you know, kind of, sort of rock armor toe protection there um, and then some erosion matting 
above that, I think. Um, so yeah, we, we looked at a, a variety of options as natural and green bank as possible. Um, but yeah, willow is, is good, but it needs to be in the right place and where you want access to the river. And it's a heavy maintenance burden, you know, for, for the council if you put a lot of that in. So we're using yeah. that in one place, but um, but elsewhere, no, we're not using it willow. Thank you. Uh, lots of comments just in general just to know that about how much people have really enjoyed your talk oh, um, and say it's really interesting to, talk, to uh, hear you talk about the different projects and that you clearly uh, really enjoy your, uh, the discipline in which you work. Oh, um, <laughs> there's a note about um, CSOs upstream for the site um, and a question about whether there are any concerns of human interaction with the water once it's deculverted, um, particularly with the stepping stone reach. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean that's only been in my mind but I, um, I mean the river, the, the Tollcross Park um, is a bit further down and the river is open there too so I, th I think that that risk has kind of been weighed up that um, it's not the only place that you can get to the river and whether there's any signage up maybe I'm not sure quite how the council are planning to approach that but um, but yeah I think I mean it, you know you're more likely to get CSOs input into the burn when there's high flows and you're less likely to have kids in the river when there's high flows so mm -hmm. hopefully those two things kind of balance each other out. Sure um a question about SEPA funding. Uh, does it uh, does SEPA require an environmental footprint or something similar uh, for an assessment of the various projects, such as the volume of concrete, earthwork, earthwork excavations, etc. As um, incident from net zero. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've not we've not had to produce that yet, but I know SEPA really have a major focus on that and reducing the you know the carbon footprint of projects. So. Yeah, we're thinking about that more and more, and that's definitely more of a focus for SEPA. So whether there will be some calculations that, that we would need to do as consultants, I don't know whether SEPA themselves do that internally, but um, yeah, it's not been a requirement yet, but I, I suspect there'll be more of that going forward. Thank you. Uh, a few, there's an awful lot of questions, so I'll, I'll take a few more. Um, but, um, uh, I think it's obviously a very engaging talk, but uh, so I'll, I'll take a few more, but um, if we can then, um, uh, we'll ask people to email you directly if uh, we don't yeah, want no to through all yep. the questions. Yep. Um, in relation to um, flooding, uh, how could the Leaving Water Project have increased flooding sensitivity? Yeah, so the Walton Street site um, is at flood risk itself, and the just the mechanism of flow, the way, the way it leaves the site and goes back into the river it kind of goes along behind the bank downstream and then back in so I think we were just very aware of of changing that mechanism um but what what we've done with the new channel is we've we've designed it to to manage flows so that the, the rest of the site doesn't flood anymore you know with the restored channel um so that that has yeah and and we've obviously tested the in the 1d 2d model we've, we've done a flood risk check so so we're happy yeah it's yeah and it's the same with bathgate you know we've we've got this big big area um and if we take away some of these throttling structures you know we're going to increase flow but we have area to work with you know to potentially offset that mm -hmm. but that's it's just quite an intricate process to, to work through that but that the flood risk element is certainly important um and if you've got more space then it's easier obviously to manage that the Leaven water site was was tight um, and we didn't have an existing flood risk issue but we were very aware of not causing any other issues than we had sure. so, yeah, we were able to design that out um there's a question in relation to the last example which i think was possibly the um uh, in, yeah the bathgate one again bathgate, um yeah. saying that there's no real reduction in flood risk compared to the other ones um how would you perceive gaining funding um in terms of the fact that the amount of grant and aid would likely be minimal uh, sorry, I don't understand that. The, the, it relates to flood risk, are you talking about? Yeah, in relation to flood risk, there's a question just uh, saying about in comparison to other ones, um, how um, does that work in terms of the grant and aid? Um, the, because, well, these projects are not flood risk focused, really the, the outcome is to not increase flood risk. If we can improve it, then great. The other projects don't, don't really improve flood risk massively either i don't think the lever and water i think is neutral tool cross i think was pretty much neutral if maybe some benefit for surface water um so yeah the flood risk driver it's not it's not a driver of these projects um just it's obviously an important consideration so yeah bathgate is is being funded for the improvement in the river um morphology and um and then you know the wider landscape improvement so yeah hopefully that answers your question Thank you. I hope it, yes. Um, a question in relation to um, prioritising water courses. Uh, water courses. Um, is there an, uh, a 
particular uh, tool that you use in terms of prioritizing which sections to focus on in these river restoration projects? Yeah, so our, our, um, well, our main example of that is the, the white cart study. I think because the SEPA funding is, is focused on urban areas, you know, and, and, and those particular things, the, the checklist that I, I talked through with, you know, areas of social deprivation and um, publicly owned land, you know, there are just certain things that just become more obvious, you know, if you've got council owned land and you've got some pressures you can remove and you're close to an area of deprivation, then those projects are generally going to win out. And that was why Barhead came to the, the top of the list, really, um, for those reasons. So there was obviously, you know, multiple objectives going on. We were looking at natural flood management. We looked up in, in the, the upper catchment, you know, agricultural land and everything, but but actually SEPA and, and Eastern Infrastructure Council's focus was on the urban areas. And um, yeah, this is just such a, a public area that you know you can get a lot of benefit from doing it so yeah so I think that's the prioritization is, is likely to be focused on those kind of elements. Sure thank you. Uh, no question uh, that's not directly relating to river restoration and um, it's oh I can't hear yeah. you sorry I've, I've, I missed that. Can you hear me now? Yeah you're coming in and out a wee bit but <laughs> sorry. Uh, apologies. Um, uh, Athleen, if, uh, if I'm not coming through very clearly, if you can take over if I do depart again. Um, there's a question in relation to the visualisations of Bathgate Water um, oh, and saying yeah. how effective they were. Um, but a comment just in relation to sort of um, inclusivity, really, um, in terms of considerations for um, including sort of um, uh, people who are perhaps disabled uh, mm. or who are from a different sort of range of backgrounds um, and say not a specific criticism of the visuals it says but it's fine this is a common theme across our industry uh, sure. that perhaps we should include more diverse range of people yeah um, yeah yeah I, I will pass that on to the landscape team absolutely <laughs> uh, right I'll just take the last two now um, because there are lots of questions still flowing <laughs> through so, how has long-term management of the river and the wider corridor um, been factored into designs? Yeah, very important part of the design, really. So for the lever and water, we, the, our, the project manager and the council has engaged with the parks team and, and really needed their sign off on the scheme before it could progress. You know, we needed to be sure that they were happy. And some of the landscape proposals have been tweaked on that basis, you know, things that they weren't pre prepared to maintain. Um, for Bathgate, yeah, we're very aware that um, we can increase the maintenance burden. So there might be a change. So looking to, you know, m maintain some areas less and there might be different maintenance in, in other areas. So yeah, that's very much a consideration as we go through for the, particularly for the landscape proposals. But um, yeah, the, the maintenance period is it's written into the works information and, and um, but it has to be signed off by the council who's, or whoever is going to maintain it in the long term. So yeah. Sure, thank you. Uh, and now the last question I'll take is in relation to um, the pressures that you were talking about. Uh, this question is, it says, one of the pressures is hydraulic structures, weirs, barrages, bridges and culverts. Um, which of these hydraulic structures has the highest pressure to the engineering um, designer? Uh, and I suppose in relation to that, in terms of the challenges that presents in terms of the costs um, to incorporate these? Mm, yeah, I suppose it depends on, it depends on the location. So there was one weir that I showed that is built on bedrock and actually as a as a project to remove that it's fairly straightforward but a weir in another location could be entirely different you know it because because that particular one is it's downstream of the town it's a little bit more rural and um, there's not so much in the way of utilities and infrastructure around about it and it's on bedrock so when you take the structure out you know the any erosion impact is going to be fairly minimal um, so yeah, I think, whereas, you know, at Bathgate, we're looking at these throttling structures and things, there's there's a lot of, you know, there's more change in the hydrology and um, yeah, maybe more major structures to take out potentially embankments and things, you know, that's, you've got, there's a lot to consider there. So yeah, it really just depends on your setting, I think, um, and how, how much impact the structure is having. Um, you know, if we're thinking about removing the gabions at the lever water, you know, we've really got to consider the erosion impact. It may be a fairly small job in itself to take those out, but you've got to think about what you have to put in place, you know, to maintain that bank as well. So yeah, it's, it's probably site specific. 
Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, we'll stop taking questions there because I said there was an awful lot of uh, questions still coming through. But I say, just from, from the general comments, people have really enjoyed your talk, Sally. Oh, good, um, thank you. So, yeah, so as Chair of the Scottish Branch, thank you so much for giving this presentation tonight. No uh, and if anyone does have any questions, um, if you could use Sally's email um, on the screen uh, to send her any additional questions we're not be able to get through. Um, I'd like to pass over finally uh, to Ashleen, who's going to tell you about some of the up upcoming events we've got for the Scottish Branch. Hey, um, so just as Alice said there, thanks again to Sally for delivering such an engaging presentation. Um, it's great to hear someone that's clearly so passionate about their work. Um, it's great to hear that. Um, and also thanks to everyone that signed in and taken the time out of their evening to join us. Um, and just again, as we said at the start, this talk will be available from the SciWEM website online. So if you'd like to flag it to any colleagues that perhaps had to miss out tonight, feel free to share that. Um, and yes, as Alice said, just to highlight two key SIWEM events coming up online. Um, so there's on the 10th of December, COVID-19 in the water sector, and that's going to be a webinar focused on the green recovery. Obviously a very timely, timely talk, talk at the minute. And also on the 17th of December, there'll be a webinar on net zero carbon in the water industry, which again, especially looking towards COP26 next year is going to become obviously a key topic for our industry as a whole. Um, full details of these are on the SIWEM website um, and on a more local scale we as a branch are drafting our program for the next year um, with events new events upcoming in the new year um, we've got a couple of things penciled in at the minute with dates to be confirmed um, this includes a talk on river surveys for river modeling um, by JBA consulting um, we'll also have a talk from ACOM around the work that they're doing with Scottish Water and, and Morrison Construction as part of the Caledonia Water Alliance um, and on that note, if there's anyone on this call that is interested um, in doing a talk in future, please feel free to get in touch with us via our LinkedIn page. Um, or if you've got my email from the website, feel free to drop me a message. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Thank you again, everyone, for dialing in and thank you to Sally. We'll bring it to a close. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you for the talk, um, Sally. It was really, really interesting. And Alice for enabling us for all the work you've done to organise this event. And uh, you had a successful one, I think. Indeed, yes. There's an awful lot of questions that so it's <laughs> coming through saying how wonderful it was. And obviously, really oh, enjoyed good. your discipline. Oh, so, um, yes, I think it's uh, you've got a lot of people thinking. There were so many questions. I was trying to flick through them and just pick <laughs> out the ones that uh, covered a most diverse range. But I say there was other ones about. Um, uh, I don't know, Barbara, is it possible to perhaps print screen um, some of the uh, uh, questions uh, or to download them um, so that Sally could uh, have a look at some of them? Yeah, we should be, we should be able to do that. Um, okay. The very old fashioned copy and paste. Ah, oh, that's true, yes. Because <laughs> there's a few, there was one that just came in as I, uh, as I was bringing it to a close about sort of environmental net gain um, and uh, think about e ecosystem services, which mm -hmm. obviously is sort of is a growing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really, which would be quite interesting so just out of interest, i appreciate obviously people are, are yeah, generally yeah. leaving but is that something that um did you do any ecosystem services assessments so we were you know with the biodiversity net gain is obviously something that's required down south now but um so we've done but we did it on the lever water just as a kind of example like you know because we're making such a big change to that one site yeah. in particular we suggested it and 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 we just did it as part of our assessment and and yeah really I think people are really pleased for that. So I really hope that if we do that more, that it might become more normal. Um, so yeah, that certainly that the biodiversity net gain is, is certainly something that can quite easily be incorporated in the in the project. So, but yeah, I, in terms of other other uh, measurements, I'm not sh I'm not sure, but um, that's certainly one one route we're m moving down. So yeah. Yeah, I think it helps SEPA to um, to sell the project, you know, and 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 the council as well to be able to say in numbers this is the improvement yeah. that we're making, you know, and I think I think they're really keen to be able to do that to show that there was so much chat about that at the River Restoration Conference um, in September whenever we had that there was lots of chat about biodiversity net gain in particular, but you know just mm -hmm. um, I, I having that metric there just to show what what impact we're having. So yeah, I think it's good. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah.
Yes, because there's the potential there to actually have all those ecosystem benefits, which includes the cultural ones as well. So it's mm. connecting people up with the history, perhaps, of the river. And the yeah, that's something I really, I, because these areas have been, you know, I've got so much history to them, industrial as it mm. may be, uh, that's really something I want to bring out of the project. So in Barhead, you know, I think there was a, a steelworks or something and, and, so the bridge that's going to be left on site is was probably built in Barhead and things you know we're just trying to uh, you know hopefully and uh, get some funding to have signage and interpretation and just you know engage people oh, yeah. with that aspect of it and same in Bathgate as well I really am keen that that you know we're saying we're making improvement here this is not perfect but this is because the history of the site this is where the river's how the river's changed and this is what we've tried to do and I just explain the project from that side of things you know because yeah they're not they're not per perfect sites and they've had a long history so people are interested in that you know they kind of want to know what they're looking at when they when they see different features in the landscape so yeah i think that heritage aspect is important definitely thank you um barbara in terms of putting this um talk up onto the um youtube site and onto the sound website um are there is there anything else you need from Sally and at one point there was um just to confirm that there are all the images that you had in your um, presentation was sort of you had to copyright and things and it was that they were all either produced by Acom or copyrighted and things yeah, um yeah, yeah yes perfect. yeah no they are they're, yep they're all fine and I think even mm -hmm. on my maps I either have the license or they were free GIS background mapping or whatever you know so um, mm -hmm. I don't think there should be anything in there so yeah. is it easiest to save it as a pdf is that the best way of giving it to you or do you want the PowerPoint? How does, what's the best way? What we'll, what we'll do is we've got, we've recorded the event. So we can pick it up. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The website, we've got a YouTube. Yeah. So I've, I've, in, the, in the chat, I've put in the link. That okay. Cool. Great. Excellent. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, it was brilliant, Sally. I really enjoyed it yeah, as well. Thanks. Well, um, <laughs> nice to get the feedback. <laughs> I appreciate that. You covered, covered them so well, like in such a short time. As well. um, I know. I realised I was I, I was a lot bit over in my time, but um, didn't I'm even sorry, notice. Was that interesting? <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> I'm glad. No, I really enjoyed it. That's cool. Yeah. We had 170 people. Uh, 170. All... Yeah. Okay. That's that's uh, that's a pretty good number. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Brilliant. The other thing that you could perhaps do as well is, as you've got um, the COP26 coming to Glasgow, as again, linking in that with climate change and how this yeah. change. And also, you've got an equivalent um, COP15, which is for the um, Convention on Biological Diversity. Mm, yep. Using the ecosystem services and, 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 and quality. Again, that can be linked to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we certainly had talked a bit about that, and then because it was obviously put off and things, we've we've not um not moved any further. But yeah, I'm I'm keen that we that we do have a presence there in some way or another, um, mm -hmm. and and have those discussions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know it's something we'd mentioned as a branch before as well, mm -hmm. and then like COVID happened. But yeah, definitely, yeah. it's a opportunity. Protect yeah, absolutely. We're getting to in the climate emergency as well. That it's really this is the one to try and make a change, and we're quite lucky that's going to be so close. Yeah, this is very keen to do a series of net zero um, uh, webinars. And again, if you have um, need to do some get the linking with those, then let me know so we can promote and. What I've been doing is putting these together for across the board, whichever branch or group or if it's um, international or national, try and uh, put them under theme headings. We you have digital series, so again, it sort of feeds in and then you can look, in, um, look at how that uh, interacts with the connects with the webinars. Perfect. Thanks, Barbara. Um, yes, we've got our next committee meeting on the 9th. So we, yeah, we're going to be talking about the programme uh, in terms of, sort of linking up um, with the events. Um, can I just double check in terms of events? Um, am I right in thinking it's still eight weeks of um, advance notice that you need or has that gone up with with COVID <laughs> to nine or ten? A minimum, a bare minimum of four, but ideally six. Okay, that's perfect. Um, because then 
it just gives me time to put it on the up on the website and promote it properly. And yeah, we are quite sure. Short stuff. <laughs> well, that's what I was thinking. Yes, yeah, so, so I just wanted to check if things are sort of yeah, it expanded slightly. But um, yeah, that's fine. If you get the program to me, so I have an idea, so that I can then schedule it in. And also, it's important for getting those Zoom slots. As well, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm beginning cool. to get some of the programs and some other branches, so it's um, trying to sort of make sure that we fit all of them in, and then we can promote them as digital series. And as well. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for all the work you've been doing. It's been really good. Yeah. Yes, great job, everyone. <laughs> So this one's Ashley, I have to take any credit for this, this is pretty Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> Sally did all the hard stuff. So. Well, today, but not, not all the rest of the time. <laughs> uh, and, um, cool, well, let everybody go and enjoy their evening then. <laughs> well, thanks well, very much again, Sally. Children. Yeah, thank you, thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye.